So let me just say a couple of introductory remarks and then we're going to dive right into the panel. So I want to say because the bundle of rights granted to copyright holders includes performance, right, display, and distribution as well as copying. It's not just about copying. You can't talk about teaching without talking about copyright. Uh, luckily, there's a body of relatively simple, well-established law that <laughs> largely exempts traditional face-to-face uh, -face educational uses, right? The kind of stuff you do in your classroom, teachers feel pretty confident about that stuff. In fact, librarians sometimes say to me with horror, you know, my professors think that whatever they do, they don't ever have to ask uh, any permission of anybody. Um, that's actually when they're in their, in their wheelhouse, like in their classroom, showing a picture in a slide, you know, doing the traditional typical things, they actually are probably okay, right? We're in a pretty good, comfortable uh, space when you're just talking about traditional teaching. Um, as in all things, however, right, the ground is shifting under our feet when we start recreating these established practices in an online world. These issues have been percolating for years in the educational library communities, right, streaming films, open courseware, electronic reserves, digitizing our collections, and the list goes on. Um, the breadth of library activity that we addressed in the ARL Code of Best Practices and Fair Use gives you an idea of how much stuff uh, libraries are doing that needs this new thinking about what are the legal rationales that might apply. Um, so far, though, these issues have been kind of percolating. Uh, at a speed relatively slow and deliberate over a decade or so, and in a way uh, that, you know, on the, on the whole, that is often low-key. Lots of people are doing things, and, and there are some high-profile lawsuits, but there are lots of things happening without being on the front pages of the news. Um, this is all kind of typical stuff for academe, right? This is the way you're comfortable doing things. And then along come MOOCs which are creatures of the Silicon Valley startup culture as much as they are of the ivory tower and all these copyright conundra which we've been wrestling with in the library world uh, are implicated now in these projects that have the highest possible profile, right? They're on the covers of newspapers and they're moving at the speed of light. Uh, and yet while many of the seemingly existential questions that MOOCs raise about higher education have been asked and answered, almost ad nauseum in every way you can imagine in, in the recent uh, uh, onslaught of news stories. The questions that MOOCs raise about copyright are, are not, haven't been widely discussed in public yet. Uh, I know MOOC platforms and participating institutions are grappling valiantly with these issues in private, but for those of you not engaged in those discussions, this panel is one of the first opportunities for all of us to kind of speak publicly uh, about identifying those issues and, uh, that MOOCs raise with respect to copyright. And the stakes for libraries may be quite high. If we credit the most extravagant claims about MOOCs, uh, that they represent sort of the future of higher education, uh, then what is the future of libraries if the bulk of our collections are seen as off limits for use in MOOCs because of copyright anxiety and uncertainty? Um, as the traditional locus of copyright expertise on campus, how can a typical academic library best serve one of these kinds of projects? So we have an extraordinarily qualified panel to explore these questions today. Their bios are in your materials and we want to have as much time for discussion as possible. So I'll point you there for the details about how wonderful all of my friends here are. Um, and we'll get right to the discussion. Uh, there are three big categories of issues that we want to talk about. Uh, one is when can copyrighted material be used without permission? Another is when and how do we negotiate permission when it is necessary to ask? Uh, and, and the third is, what about the new content that is created for MOOCs? You know, this, these courses, these videos, who owns it, and how should its copyright be managed? All right, these are the three big barrels. So, uh, on the first barrel, I'm going to first turn immediately to my right uh, to, to uh, Dr. Cruz, Kenny Cruz from Columbia, using third-party material without permission. I wonder, Kenny, if you could talk a little bit about, uh, kind of do some issue spotting for us. Sure. What is the relevant law, you know, briefly, what are the key provisions in the Copyright Act that typically have allowed copying and distribution without permission and that we need to think about here? Sure. Be happy to, and th thank you very much, and thanks to all of you and everybody at OCLC and here at Penn and to everybody out there in distance learning land who is tapping in on this and, and, and learning from afar. 
Um, very, a really good question, and let me ask, answer it just as it generally as, as possible. There are a few avenues for using other persons, other copyrighted materials owned by other persons. And, and, one, and you frame the question in a way that anticipates one of those, and that is permission. Uh, the, but the others are what, what we also find ourselves leaning on and often where we find ourselves having difficulty calculating what the law really is. The big one, of course, is fair use. And the question of fair use, and, and if you were to take a look at the text of the fair use statute, at the core of it is four factors, a set of four factors that we're told to, according to the word in the statute, consider. But in reality, it's define, evaluate, weigh in the balance, and reach a reasoned conclusion about what is fair use. Another avenue to keep open are the other exceptions in the Copyright Act. Fair use is the one that we tend in education to lean on most heavily, talk about most often. But there are other exceptions, and you alluded to, for example, a specific statute that allows the use of the display and performance, at least, of material in the live face-to-face -face classroom, and also transmitting that content out, but under very, very rigorous conditions that most, I would wager most of our uh, educational institutions represented in this room are, are not therefore using. And then not to be forgotten is, is another avenue to keep open is the use of materials that are in the public domain. Works that, what we mean by copyright domain is works that have no copyright protection. And I would say that there are two categories that we probably turn to most often there. And those are works that, that are disqualified from protection, factual facts, for example, or works produced by the U.S. government, not your state government, not your city government, but U.S. government. And the other category is public domain works that are public domain because they're very old. Because copyright does last for many, many years, but eventually it does expire. And so depending upon what your course subject matter is, there may be a lot of material that is in the public domain because the copyright has expired, and that may be suitable for strengthening your course. Great. So, so, those, are the, so the, those are the provisions that we've employed actually for a long time in, in education. I wonder, so Kevin Smith from Duke University Libraries, I wonder if you could talk to me a little bit about whether and how MOOC teaching is different from that traditional teaching that libraries have been supporting. You know, there's, there's a kind of publishing feel to it rather than teaching, and there's also for-profit and non-profit distinctions that don't always come up for us traditionally. Um, what do you think about that? What's this? move into MOOCs mean for those traditional assumptions that we have? Well, I think it, it makes a significant impact on those traditional assumptions. As, as Kenny has just indicated, some of what we have relied on in the classroom teaching simply doesn't apply. The face-to-face -face teaching exceptions or the ones for transmitting probably don't apply in the MOOC environment, which means we're usually back to two, al well, three alternatives. One is permission. One is some kind of material that's either in the public domain, or I'll add to that, is licensed in a way that we can use it in a MOOC. Uh, but a lot of the time we are looking at fair use. And the fair use analysis, I think, looks a lot the same, but probably needs to be mu a little more conservative. Um, be because of the huge audience more than anything else. Simply because so many people um, can access this material. I think we have to be more careful in looking at fair use. And I think Kenny talked about the four factors, but most recently we've seen our courts asking a different set of questions. And the question, the primary question they're asking is, is the use transformative? Um, so we can strengthen the, the degree to which our uses in Coursera lectures or MOOC lectures is trans are transformative by making sure that we use only very small portions of copyrighted work and only use materials that are subject directly to criticism and comment are, are really incorporated fully into the pedagogical moment uh, where they occur. 
Um, I think in those situations, uh, and, and at Duke we've designed some guidelines for our faculty to help them think that way. Uh, in those situations, I think there is the ability to rely on fair use, but again, in a much more conservative way. <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you quickly one example. Um, we had a faculty member who wanted to use an entire Monty Python video in one of his lectures. This is not unusual, and this is, this is why the advice, in my opinion, to not rely on fair use, to, to never use third-party materials, is unrealistic. Because, um, well, never mind, that's a different sermon. <laughs> in this particular instance, the faculty member wanted to use the entire video. We attempted to get permission. We were unable to get a response. So we weren't denied permission. This is the most common experience, of course. We just couldn't get a response. So what ultimately happened, and we worked this out with the instructor, and, and fortunately we had an instructor who was willing to think in creative ways. What happened is we provided a link to the video on YouTube. Uh, and you may know Monty Python has their own channel. They're authorized on YouTube. Um, so that students could go and look at it. And then we, we clipped from that video three 15 to 20 second clips that were exactly where the professor wanted to focus. And so we, you know, we didn't think we could claim fair use for the entire video, but we did for those very short clips that were the subject of specific pedagogical comment. Great, thanks Kevin. And then, uh, so Kyle Courtney, you're at Harvard, you're working on the same kinds of issues, supporting a MOOC, and I wonder uh, if you could uh, give us uh, Kevin just gave us a great example. I wonder if you could describe the fair use argument. Characterize sure. what would a fair use argument look like for so, this kind of case. Uh, absolutely happy to. Um, we're, we're taking the fair use argument and dividing it, I guess, in two. <laughs> um, and the first track is uh, the first track is materials that are used in presentations. So third-party materials, only in presentations. And we split that out from your traditional course readings and reserve readings that do exist. Now, I think that those take two very different formulas. Mm. At Harvard, we're trying to press, and I only speak to HarvardX, I don't speak as the edX as a whole, and I realize I'm the only edX kid on the panel here. Um, but the idea that the presentation materials, we are focusing on educational, transformative, fair use for those materials. And when we look at it, we do exactly, I think, uh, what was said, we are trying to get the professor to understand that they need to use the exact amount that is necessary to fulfill their educational purpose. Now that's hard sometimes. Um, that's a difficult task. You know, they want to put up pictures of Einstein when they're talking about Einstein. They want to put up pictures of uh, some other famous person when they're talking about that person. But we're staying away from the aesthetics of it. Um, Katie Vale, who's at edX, says, don't put up any image that's for the lulls, the, the laughs, so the cartoon of the slides between. Um, and so our fair use argument there is if you go towards that educational, transformative fair use, you're not only clearing the way for us to use this in the future, and by the way, get more examples for me to feed other faculty members, because they, they learn by example, but also that I think it enhances the ability for the teaching to actually be tied to the class itself. So if we put up a cartoon from the New York Times, does that necessarily inform the discussion or the pedagogical reasons they're choosing to use those images? No. We think that the transformative educational fair use actually helps the professor help think, why am I using this image? How am I engaging the students on this level? So we think the, the transformative fair use, specifically with the presentations, both aids our argument for fair use and also aids the educational mission of the class itself. The second tier of the fair use is the readings. And as we know, um, there's probably plenty of reserve librarians in here that have dealt with this for years, uh, putting stuff online versus putting stuff in the library for reserves, dealing with journal articles. Because of the nature of reserves in the world today, and obviously I'm sure, you know, to my left, this is the expert on this, <laughs> that there's a real problem right now with e-reserves and hosting journal articles online and behind a pinwall and stuff like that. We're trying to stay away from that. So we're, our separate tracks are presentation materials and course reserves. And as far as that goes, we're trying to encourage the faculty to provide open, ac open access materials, uh, materials that are in our depository, which is Dash at Harvard, uh, materials that are at least licensed in a way that allows us to share, and Creative Commons being one of those areas. Um, or 
you know, the worst intention of it is, uh, you know, if you go down the scale, A plus gold is we get a PDF of it and we can distribute it worldwide. The last one is we just cite to it. We cite to this because we're not capable of getting the rights and we're not willing to risk um, getting sued um, by distributing this so massively. So if we put up a citation, we allow the students to let their fingers do the walking and I find that sites such as Scribd and other ones, you can find all sorts of materials online that you thought would be under copyright. Um, so it's not on us to provide that linking and information, but we put it, the burden on the students. Mm -hmm. So those are our two fair use tracks that we're doing right now, or at least we're attempting to do. Can I me? Yeah, th th this is, a, this is a, a great discussion. We're all learning from each other. A and, and a couple of thoughts come to mind. W one is amplifying on, on some things that we've just heard. The, the transformative issue, there are probably quite a few people out there thinking now, now what exactly do, do those lawyer types mean by, by transformative? Yeah. And, and, and where, where transformative comes up in the analysis is if you were to look at those four factors of fair use, the first factor is purpose and character of the use. And generally, there's been a lot of body of law to, to, that we rely upon about nonprofit educational purposes are largely favored in that context. Although we're blurring the lines a little bit because of the involvement with for-profit entities as part of this MOOCs revolution. But with respect to that first factor, courts have developed the, this additional doctrine of transformative use, and, and they, they really like it in the sense that if they see it, it's a very powerful argument on the first factor in favor of fair use. You still got three more factors to go before you have a decision. But, but, but if uh, there are two types of transformative. One is where you have actually changed the work. So you've turned it into something new. And I would say we do a lot of that if it's that artwork, if it's that image, if it's that cartoon, if it's that short film clip that we're really embodying in an instructional context. We've really turned it into something new. Um, and then the other type of transformative is where you've migrated it to a new context. Some of that is what we do, some of it not. And, it, and I think that's not the strongest transformative argument to make. And then this discussion is also reminding me to, to, to really add a couple more subtle points to my previous answer about what are the alternatives for proper use of, of third-party owned material. And, and I would add to it, just emphasizing what I just heard, citing to it, now a citation raises no serious copyright questions to think about, um, sending people to that resource to find it on their own, no problem, and linking and embedding by virtue of links. There, there's room for us to have an intellectual exercise about copyright implications, but in most of those situations, we're, we're going to come away feeling really good, just linking out to that source. Little problem from a copyright perspective. It may be behind a paywall, but that's another problem. Great, great. So uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is obtaining permission, but before we move to that, which is a huge discussion, I want to ask, what's, what is the risk if we, uh, why keep this first topic open for conversation? Why do anything other than obtain permission and walk away when you don't get permission? Why should libraries push for this fair use option and these related options? I, I have to jump in because I just think it's impractical not to. Um, the fact is our, our instructors have been used to using materials, to illustrating their lectures, to doing all kinds of things like that for many, many years. And if we tell them, if all that we say is, if we can't get permission, you can't use it, I think we're, we're offering such a negative message that it will be ignored. And in fact, what we'll find is that far more things are done that would give us heartburn uh, then if we, if we had a serious conversation with them about fair use, about the limits of fair use in this environment, um, and encourage them, especially because we can make this connection between transformative fair use and good creative pedagogy. I think it's much more valuable to have that conversation than to pat them on the head and say, sorry. And there's a, there's a double, there's a 
double-edged sword there. Um, we're trying to form up um, teams of librarians that are associated with the uh, Harvard X programs that are coming out of the school. So if it's a biology class, we have a biology librarian. If it's a history class, we have a history librarian. We want to get to them early and often and not only spread the message of educational transformative fair use and understanding about reserve readings and licensing, but also that person would be in the best position to offer the options. So I don't think we can use this article because it's owned by X publisher. However, since I'm an expert in the field of biology, uh, here's some open access journals where we may be able to draw from. Here are some additional. So the, the copyright talk can also lead to the here are some alternate resources talk that librarians, I find, are, you know, we're the experts in that kind of information. Mm -hmm. So associating that together, you can get the dual message across. That's a great mm -hmm. point. And, and, and I, would add, I would add as well that we may have a situation where we would all look at it and say, well, we have to get permission to use that much film <laughs> footage, to use that many pages from that printed work. However, let me talk about your option of fair use. Right. If you reduce it, and we already heard uh, one of those examples with the Monty Python e example. If you cut it down from the original whatever number of minutes down to those brief clips, you could say the same thing about the text work. <laughs> and then send the students elsewhere to find the whole thing. Great. And I, I want to emphasize something that Kyle said earlier. Another experience that we had was with a lot of those readings, and I agree sure. with the two tracks. <laughs> Wish I'd said that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> where a faculty member who discovered that he couldn't get permission for all of the readings he wanted to put up from publishers realized that where he's the author, he, we looked at journal policies. He actually had um, his submitted manuscripts. All of a sudden, he's using our open access repository. He has also gone to some of his colleagues and said, have you considered making a copy, a version of this article open access so I can link to it? Yeah. So uh, yeah. it has been a, a, an interesting introduction to open access. Great. All right, so let's move to uh, obtaining permission. And uh, the first thing I want to ask about uh, is libraries are actually very savvy licensors, right? License, we, we obtain licenses all the time. That's, that's actually a lot of what libraries are doing these days. More than 60% of our materials, according to ARL statistics, are electronic licensed materials now. Um, can we use those materials in a MOOC, Kenny? What? <laughs> <laughs> you asking me? <laughs> Thank heaven. Um, uh, all right, here's, here, here's the answer. I'm pulling out my lawyer degree and I'm saying, it depends. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it depends what the license says. So, so I, I've been saying this for many years, and I think I get to say it with even more emphasis today. That person in your library who is negotiating, reviewing, and approving those agreements, those license agreements, may be the most important person in the building. Because that's the person who is hands-on making determinations about how your collections may be used. Yeah. And so, and it could be anything. We've been debating interlibrary loan and course reserves and course packs for decades, and now we're we're and we've had in, we've had distance learning in, in its in its various incarnations, and MOOCs is another incarnation of that distance learning dilemma. So that those license agreements. So it really does. It really does depend what it says. So now let's make it small scale, not that great big license for that giant expensive database. Let's say we are building this MOOC, we have contacted that one rights holder for the permission to use that one work. The kind of questions that keep coming up are, great, we got that last year, can we put it in this year's version of the MOOC? It depends what the permission says. So write those permissions carefully. When you contact somebody, when you confirm your permission in writing, write it down carefully. Get multi-year permission if that's what you have in mind. Get multi-platform permission if that's what you have in mind. If you're working with organization number one, say Coursera, and you, you envision that next year or five years from now you'll be with a different organization, get that as part of your written permission. So writing those permission licenses, if you will, is an important um, task filled with nuance that can shape your success in the future. 
and uh, Kevin Smith from Duke. I wonder, you've, you've, you've started trying to negotiate some of these licenses. How's it going? What's it like? <laughs> What's it like when you try to negotiate a license for a MOOC? It depends. Yeah. <laughs> no, it really does. They're we, a sponsor of this we, conference, we, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're sitting still. Well played. Uh, uh, our successes have been very mixed. We've had some good successes where uh, folks have, have understood and given us permission. We've had some instances where there have been small fees. We did have a publisher ask us for their standard 26 cents per page per student, which in the particular course would have cost over $20,000 for one semester use of, a two, page, of two pages. Uh, that was not practical. Uh, we've had some flat no's. Uh, the most common reaction that we get is no reaction at all. Uh, that is, we don't get a response. Although uh, at Duke, our provost has uh, authorized the employment of a full, uh, full time. She's an intern who works 15 hours a week, but all she works on is permissions for the MOOC. She works out of my office, and she's been great and very persistent and just a, a person who is, and I think these characteristics are important, very calm, very quiet, soft-spoken and persistent. She just doesn't go away. Um, and going back again and again and saying, let me explain a little bit more about what this is and why we think it's valuable. Let me explain to you, for example, that if you give us free permission to use these illustrations from your textbook in our lectures, 40,000 people who have self-identified an interest in this work will have your textbook recommended to them by somebody who's recognized as an authority in the field. Mm -hmm. This is great marketing. Uh, explaining that. Sometimes explaining it not to the rights people, but some, somewhere up the ladder yeah. uh, is very helpful. So at HarvardX, we are trying to rely exclusively on educational transformative fair use. And we are trying not to seek permissions, if at all possible. It's, that, that is our absolute goal. Um, however, <laughs> if there are situations where the professor is like, this is the seminal article in the field about this, or something along those lines where we would need to go out, we write a permission letter, carefully worded permission letter, uh, that says, hey, we're at X, we're nonprofit, this is online, it's for free, can you give us free permission? And we've had various responses from that. Now, I've removed all names to, to protect the innocent or guilty, but I, just a couple quick responses as, as a war story here. We had very, one very large publisher uh, receive our letter, and I was wondering if they read it at all. And so that will be $3,000. <laughs> and I was like, okay, um, no, we, you know, we don't pay. We're not going to pay for this particular circumstance. We're nonprofit, et cetera. So they said, right, right, right. Fifteen hundred. <laughs> I was like, I don't think we get it. So we actually had the professor write, and they still it ultimately it was a no. So we did not use that article. Um, we've had other reactions that were low cost, which is nice, um, but we don't want to go down that road necessarily because it is a slippery slope. If we start paying once, we'll have to pay many, many, many times. Um, the last one, as far as permissions, is where we have uh, an edge. So. The professor that's launching the course also wrote the textbook. Clearly has connections to a publisher already. And not, not the rights or permissions department, as we had talked about her. Uh, probably an editor or the marketing department or something like that. And so we actually have that individual contact them. And this worked out for the computer science course. We had some like 150,000 registrations. Um, and they gave us for free uh, a downgraded or crippled version of the textbook which was, it was basically JPEGs of the entire book. So the student, if they did not want to pay, could flip through the pages. I was slightly onerous, but nevertheless, it, it protected in a way they couldn't copy and paste, et cetera. And with the link, you know, the link to the actual Amazon or the book, and they sold every copy in every warehouse in the world. And after, there was like something like a 2,000% increase. So after that, that became a model for certain courses where the professor has written the textbook and wants to use the textbook as the main thrust. So we actually uh, kind of shift the burden because if, if it, the letter comes from me or somebody in my department, it's not as important as if it comes from the person that authored the book for the publisher. So we found that those have been useful permission-like. 
uh, and those, situation. those kinds of stories that you just told about selling out the textbook, <clears throat> those yes. are very helpful yes. to tell Absolutely. to the next mm -hmm. next group that you're asking for, and they and they really do want to hear those stories. They do, and, and and along the way, Kyle, as well, you also clarified your your opening point about how you rely on fair use and not permission. Obviously, you do attempt permission from time to time. But what you mean by rely on fair use, it's not that you're saying it's all fair use. Right. This means that there are times when you just simply say no. Yeah. We can't put that in. And it happens. And, and it, happens. it has to happen. Uh, because, again, we're, you know, the library is doing risk mitigation. I mean, literally. Um, we're, we're showing, you know, can we go, how far can we push it? And right. I think everybody on this panel will want to push it as far as possible. But, you know, I have to answer to a higher authority. And, 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 and what, 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 you know, the library? Okay. The, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court. <laughs> the, the, the library's involved in risk mitigation, and at the same time, the library and all of us are involved in education and learning maximization. And there's the tension yes. that surrounds these copyright issues. But I think that really gets us back to the wonderful point that Kyle made earlier, that when we need to say no, as good librarians, we shouldn't be saying no. We should be saying, we can't use that. Let us help you find some Something alternatives. Else, yeah. what are my and alternatives? of course, when you, when you focus on transformative fair use, then for the materials that are just there for the LOL, <laughs> that are just illustrative or something like that, it's much easier to say to explain why they don't meet the argument for transformative fair use and to say, but this is something that you could substitute for anyway, because you don't need this picture of a Paris street. Right. Right. You just need a picture of a Paris street, so let's find you one that's licensed. Go to Flickr, we got them by right. the top Yeah, reference. exactly, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's nice because the, the sort of teaching moment, the ability of librarians to help find alternatives and the copyright analysis sort of converge. They do. They do. That's a great transition to the final topic, which is ownership issues, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. If libraries uh, are increasingly in this model going to be working with faculty to identify materials that have been made available open access, it seems like there's at least some impetus for us to try to pay it forward, right? So are, are any of these materials going to become open access, or what happens to the things that, not that we use, that we take in as part of the MOOCs that we, uh, that, that we support, but that our campuses create? Um, how do libraries help, uh, help, help campuses negotiate that question? And the first, let me ask uh, Kenny again to start with the fundamentals here, which is, who is gonna own MOOC content? Mm -hmm. Is it the professor? Is it the university? Is it Coursera? And, and how do you know? Yeah, yeah, good. That's a tough question. And, and I'll apologize to my other panel members if I just absorb all the rest of the time. I'm going to try. <laughs> I, I, no, no, no. It's, I'm, I'm going to try really hard not to because it's really hard to, to, to pin these down. But there are a couple of like mental bullet points that, 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 that we, can, we can reference. And, and I'll begin by saying, you know, reconstituting some of the questions as we're posing them now about ownership. Because we could be asking, all right, what's the law? I'm going to tell you that in just a minute. And then the follow-up question is, okay, what should we be doing? Because one of the reasons why I kind of like working with copyright law is, is copyright law on this point, especially ownership, sets a default. It's what you get if you don't take the time to get something else. And if you can take the time, and you have the right people at the table, you can get something else. So let me tell you what I mean by that this way. The, the fundamentals, the default, what you get if you didn't pay attention to ownership and you wake up one day and there's a dispute and you're wondering who owns this or that or the course or something else. Basic rule, here it is. If you're the one who created the work, you, you wrote the paragraphs, you said these words, you took the picture, you created the website, you are the copyright owner. You did the original work, the creative work, you're it. Now, when you think about a filmed course, call it whatever you want, um, you've got multiple players already. You've got the person who's doing the talking, you've got the person running the camera over here, you've got somebody else who did the slides. Now you've got multiple copyright owners. And you may have separate ownership of each piece or it may be melded together as a jointly owned work to be determined in front of a judge with millions of dollars of legal fees. So, so, so what we want to do is manage that 
process so that as people come together to create this wonderful collaborative work, we have managed it in an informed, reasoned, clarified way, which often involves agreements. Second bullet point, that was only one bullet point. The, 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 sec the second bullet point is that a newly created copyrighted work can be a work made for hire. And at this point, academic audiences gasp and recoil because, because work made for hire is a doctrine, comes in a couple forms, but the main one of interest to us here is where somebody is an employee as opposed to an independent contractor. I would wager to say probably most of us are employees. Our employees who created that work within the scope of our employment now we're going to arm wrestle over what that means. But that work is now a work made for hire. And under the law, it means not only does the copyright ownership belong to the employer, but the employer, IBM, Microsoft, Google, University X, Y, Z, whatever <laughs> university, um, is not only the employer copyright owner, but it is under the law the author of that work. You, the person who actually created the words, you're nobody under the law. You just faded away. And so it's a question of, of, of ownership, control, and authorship. The beauty of this, though, is everything I just said is kind of default. And, and my bottom line advocacy is we should avoid the default, we should get the players to the table, we should have well thought out policy, and we probably need written signed agreements to effectuate some of the desired outcomes. And so we need to do this in a very deliberate, careful fashion. So that was my next question for Kevin, which is what values should librarians be bringing to that conversation? If we're gonna throw out the default rules, and write agreements and be rigorous and try to create and you know take advantage of the the rights that we have under copyright to create a different kind of arrangement. What should librarians bring to the table as that voice um, distinct from other voices? I'll I'll give you two bullet points, which not will not be as well thought out or articulated as Kenny's are, but my my two <laughs> bullet points are this. First, I think by and large librarians because we tend from many, many years back to have great respect for authorship, tend to want to see copyrights held by the individual creators. And that is that I think libraries tend to be on the anti-work for hire spectrum. And in that, we're, we're along with most of our faculty who don't want to be thought of as cogs in the machine. So I, I, I think probably the most common default, and I think this is the most common default in university policies, is to say that even though the law looks like we could claim work for hire, um, we don't. We affirm the principle, this is the policy at Duke, we affirm the principle of individual ownership of works of the intellect. That's, that's how we say it in our policy. Um, second bullet point, but that, I mean, that doesn't have to be the case. I, it, is possible and there are universities that do say everything is work for hire. Second bullet point is this, if the policy is written properly, I'm not sure it matters. And the reason is because these policies, once you get writing these policies and, and agreements, they can be very detailed. They should be very detailed in this complex situation. And what they can say is they can resolve, they probably have to resolve the ownership issue. But then they can go on to say, whoever owns this work gives a license to the other party to do all these things with it. And you really, that's where you do the work, is mm -hmm. in that license. Mm -hmm. So at Duke, we affirm the principle of um, individual ownership, and we give to the faculty a fairly extensive, or they, the faculty gives to the university, excuse me, the faculty, the owners, give to the university a fairly extensive license to use the materials. At Stanford, it's just the opposite. The university claims to own the material, or at least that's what I understand, and people from Stanford can correct me. The university owns the material, but they give to the faculty creator an extensive license to use it, and the net result is not very different. 
So that leaves one, one thing, and I want Kyle to talk about this because you're at one of the edX institutions, yes. which, is, which is open access. How can that ownership relationship yeah be uh, structured to bring open access into the picture? I mean, so that's the idea that, well, at edX, the, the curiosity is how do we build a business model that will sustain us forever? Um, and so, <laughs> forever and ever, amen. Um, <laughs> so I, I think, yeah, we do have that open access policy, and I think the way the courses are created by the professors, it's we're trying to encourage use of open access materials, but. My concerns, and thankfully I don't have to be in these discussions as often, my concerns are always about the work that we do and the librarians do with regards to the copyright and then where that class ends up. So if we use something from Creative Commons that has a, a share alike license in it, and that's, you know, even if, even if it's under the guise of open access, but we're still using something that's Creative Commons authorized. Share alike says we need to give the same type of license that to the next person that goes down the road. If we package these up and sell them to someone else, how does that, we're not necessarily sharing it alike, are we? No. We're selling it to some other university to use and they're gonna use it in a different way. Um, I have not sat down at the table and even talked about this with anyone yet. Um, that doesn't mean that discussions aren't happening, they're happening over my head. Um, but I think our reliance on open access materials in the very courses that we're teaching can help inform and, and stop that problem from the get-go. And I guess we encourage our faculty members to uh, put their works into our uh, institutional repository called DASH. We also encourage them to draw upon that for mm -hmm. teaching their classes. So I'm sorry I don't have an exact on answer because I, I, I don't have an answer. Um, and I think that a lot of people are in the same boat that we are, that they're not 100% sure, but they can see the issues down the road. Great. Well, speaking of, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that may point us in a direction that libraries need to consider. If we don't yet know when, how we're going to be able to make these things more available, one thing we probably do know is that we need to preserve them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, using our repositories or whatever resources we have to archive and to curate these courses until Whatever happens, when they, yeah, whatever happens. At, the, at, the, at the end of time <laughs> is probably a responsibility that we should take on. Absolutely. Right, and, and, and in fact, you know, I've, I've written agreements and have written licenses, have written policies that include specifically that clause. Tying this back to an earlier point about what to put in a, li in a permissions uh, letter that you maybe send to a copyright owner, it may be permission, maybe because that's all they'll give you, is permission for this year, this right. semester, something mm -hmm. like that. But add in, even if that's what you have to settle on, add in a clause that said, but indefinitely the institution may archive and provide access to this semester's version for which you have given permission. So watch <laughs> the difference between long-term reuse, if you can't get that, you still want long-term archiving of the work. Yeah. Yep, okay. Great, well, so we are running short on time, uh, but uh, the last thing ran over, so maybe we can run over. Uh, just a minute, just a, just a couple of minutes, um, because we wanna give you all time to uh, ask us questions. I see at least two microphones, uh, and I hope you'll come to the mic and, and uh, sh unburden yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Or we've answered all of your questions and we can go. <laughs> I'm scared of Oh, please. Please. I have two. Is that cheating? No. Um, earlier it was mentioned uh, these courses being viewed and used in places where fair use is not a defense. Could you talk about that? And also, could Kenny or any of you address a potential fair use differentiation between for profit Coursera and nonprofit edX? I know it was sort of referenced, but do you think it's going to make a substantial difference to the factors? Who wants the territory question? I, I, I don't want the territory question. <laughs> I'm going to start with your second question, um, which is, I don't think for-profit in, in the courts and the cases that I've seen and read, and uh, I don't think for-profit is dispositive of you lose. Um, I think in, no, in fair use uh, terms, and someone did a study of all the fair use cases heard at the federal courts over the years and they thought that factor one, even when it was commercial, did not necessarily indicate that the fair use challenge was going to fail. Um, if anything, I think there is plenty of room for balance for 
transformative fair use in that first factor, um, even if it's for-profit educational or non-profit educational. So I don't think it sinks the ship, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, and, and in fact, the transformative argument uh, seems to support even commercial uses more than yes. the more traditional four-factor analysis has, which it, Kenny doesn't agree with. So. No, 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 no. Which, which, which means I'm mistaken. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not it. That's not at all what I was thinking. Um, but but I but I would say that if as a commercial, if I were if I were with a commercial entity, I, I would have to look at it and scrutinize the fair uses a little bit more carefully. Sure. Um, you know, I've, over the years, I've had plenty of questions from, from for-profit <laughs> educational institutions. You can run off the names of them in your head. And, and, you know, my answer has almost always been like this. Fair use can still apply to what you do. It's just that it applies differently, and typically not as much. But, but don't be dismayed, because if you look at some of the landmark cases, we've mentioned, uh, I think we've mentioned in this discussion, cases about, about the use of images in, in textbooks, and, and there are the uh, landmark Supreme Court decision involving transformative use. The, uh, those parties who were making the uses were commercial entities. So fair use does apply it just maybe doesn't apply as generously. Yeah. Which gets us back to what we said before about being much more careful and conservative when we do our fair use analysis in the MOOC right. environment. What was right. the other question? Territoriality? Territoriality? You mean like U.S. territory, geographic <laughs> territoriality? Well, so let's say somebody lives in, uh, you know, copyright a stand where there is no fair use. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and they would like to haul you into court in copyright of stand. They're going to they're gonna sue you for copyright infringement because even though what you're doing in the U.S. is legal in the U.S., it's not legal in copyright of stand. Is that a problem? Uh, I, I have one sort of semi-example from this. So, uh, again, everything's anonymized here. There's a course going on in Harvard X, let's say. And it. let's say students in Germany are taking this course and a German rights holder decides that that portion of that lecture, online lecture, is not fair use. They don't have fair dealing or fair use or anything there. Mm -hmm. So the video gets pulled down as part of a content ID notification, which for those of you that don't know, it's, it's kind of like um, a Digital Millennium Copyright Act violation on YouTube. Not as severe, but nevertheless, they're saying you're using this and we think you shouldn't be. Um, I am the person that you come to that does the counter notification saying, yes, this is fair use. Um, and that appeared to have worked in Germany. Now, only the German students couldn't necessarily see the work, so it was very specific. Um, but the, the video went back up as far as I know. I, I can't log in from Germany and, <laughs> and check. I would love if I could do that. Fly me over there, and I'll check for you. Um, <laughs> But so that's the one thing that happened as an example. But as far as jurisdictional claims for copyright, you know, that's usually the first hurdle on international uh, copyright laws here in the U.S. They're like, where are the servers? Or right. where's the principal place of business? Or is Yahoo going to enforce the French Act over in California? Or you know, there's a, I mean, there's and a they've ton been known of stuff, to do that. and they have been. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. Do you guys have an opinion? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Don't well, be the expert here. Well, Not well, a, 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 ba a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> a basic a basic rule about geography is when in the U.S. apply U.S. law, when in copyrightistan apply the law of whatever country that is, and and, Every other and so so but but you know the problem is. That, that as soon as we put something on the web, we're reaching all approximately, depends how you count them, 200 countries in the world, except the few that are blocking it for their own sake. And, and so, so you're, re, you're really affecting, one way or another, all of these jurisdictions. Don't be too discouraged, because we're all doing it, and you know, not a lot has gone wrong yet. But it is, a, 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 it, it is, a, it is just a, a fact that you may get this takedown notice and have to block that material. There's, an, there's a lot of music on YouTube that you cannot access in Germany. Yeah. 
plain and simple. Somebody sent me a link while I was there, I opened it up, I got a blank screen. The, um, because it's blocked. And that is just a, a that is the, is, is the minimal risk that you, you have to accept when you go into this worldwide publishing, which is what the web is all about. Can I make just two, again, two more bullet points sure. um, that, that are really just uh, sort of summaries and conclusions from what we've just heard. The first one is to note that lawsuits are almost always over commercial uses because it only makes sense to sue somebody if they're making some money because you want a piece of it. <laughs> it's not a 100% rule, but it's relevant to the second point, which is the most likely outcome from a complaint from a rights holder is a takedown notice. It's not probably going to be a lawsuit filed against you. At least that's not the first thing that's going to happen. Um, and I say that because I try to tell this to our instructors. Uh, in one sense, it gives them comfort. You know, they're not immediately going to file a lawsuit against you personally and take your home and your dog and everything else. But it's also a helpful warning because it's really embarrassing if your lecture vanishes. Um, so I, I find that a useful thing to say to instructors that the likely outcome here is one of those takedown notices. Sure. Your lecture vanishes maybe only in Germany, maybe <laughs> off the platform entirely for some period of time because uh, that's both comforting and a reminder that this can be embarrassing if you don't pay attention. Right. Great. Others? Any questions coming in online or anything? Oh, uh, we banned her from questions. Oh, she, <laughs> yeah, sorry, no lawyers. <laughs> uh, we scared uh, them all. Thanks for the great panel, really enjoyable. Um, it seems most of our responses so far have been reactive, and I'm wondering how we move into proactive mode, and if each of you were to pick your favorite advocacy issue, uh, what would it be? General. All of it? <laughs> um, convincing our faculty to retain their rights, to make it possible to make their works available in open access so that other people can use them in MOOCs, in face-to-face -face classes, in e-reserves, in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and, and, and I'll, I'll complement that too by saying that I think that a key player is of course the individual academic because they are both the user and the creator and manage, what it, whether it's MOOCs related or not, be a good steward of your own intellectual property, be aware that you are part of the system, you're part of the problem and part of the solution, prefer to be part of the solution. And then, then the other group that I would add to that is be an advocate with your central administration to really look at these issues in, in a coordinated fashion and to see the implications across different areas of academic work and develop policy accordingly. I think in mind from the, from the copyright perspective of how we are all sharing what we're doing amongst each other. So we're advocates in our own university, our own little thing but that we share. If you're at a Coursera institution and you want to talk to edX people, how edX are doing that, um, I think that's a great idea. I think if we're advocating amongst ourselves and then additionally reaching out to the faculty, I think we make a more informed library populace, which will aid both the students that are taking the MOOC course and the faculty that are creating it. Um, so I, I think that this, this is a panel that's just representing kind of that action. So mm -hmm. I'm an advocate for that sharing knowledge on this topic, which usually generates some fear. Yeah. Others? I would add that I think, you know, fair use, uh, the, the the fair use aspect I think is very important and there's that old cliche that fair use is like a muscle and courts really care what you're doing and if you don't exercise that muscle it will atrophy. So as we're in these early stages, uh, it's, it's really important to keep it on the table at least, though we're still negotiating in what form it's on the table. Uh, I think it's important to keep it on the table or it'll just be gone forever. Other questions? Okay. Well, we got one more. Oh, hey, all right. You've spoken a lot about um, the copyright issues and, and fair use. Um, it occurred to me that there's another lurking problem for certain types of resources, which is contractual limitations on access to things that would otherwise be uh, useful in fair use. You see this uh, frequently on websites 
uh, where uh, museums or, uh, or others have private collections, which they're willing to make available, uh, sometimes in very high quality, on the web, but with what purport to be contractual limitations on reuse. Uh, so not to complicate matters, but if you could uh, address that complication as well. Sure, so I, I always think of those as my analogy is uh, tin cans attached to the back of the car. And the car is the art you're getting. And the tin cans are all those terms of use that you're dealing with. Um, it's not, it's a weak analogy, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So where do you drive the car is the question. Did you just um, get married? What's yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, you're marrying yourself to this goal. So the intent here uh, that, you know, we try to avoid that if all possible. I mean, because the thing is, if you're creating this web of rights that string along and you wanna use this course for future use, and we were talking about the shelf time before of how long MOOC courses can last, you know? Could you get four years out of that one that you recorded? Could you get five? Does it depend on the topic? Uh, maybe, maybe not, but if you we're thinking about MOOCs down the road being adopted and used by other organizations, you know, this college didn't necessarily sign on to a MOOC. However, they want to buy the MOOC and then suddenly they have this professor at their college, quote unquote. When the rights are attached to that, it doesn't allow that ability for you to be as free form with sharing all this, which is I think the major intention of the MOOCs is to share all this information. So I think it's, it's counter to this and I, I try not to get involved with at least from the Harvard X perspective, with things where there are licenses or terms attached that would prevent us from using it in the future. We try our best to do that. But I, I will just add that in, in a couple of cases, we've been successful in contacting those rights holders who have, who have put those kinds of restrictions on use and getting them to expand the use to allow us to, mm -hmm. to use them in the MOOC. So you can always ask. And, and, and I'm gonna add something that's actually a a, a little self-promotion. Um, are we allowed to do that? Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 non-commercial. I'll make no money off of this. The um, um, but the but you've actually that specific issue of of museums and their policies is one of my pet peeves, and and I did a major uh, funded research project on exactly that, analyzing the law, analyzing museum policies. And, and taking them to task on exactly these issues. I'll send you a link where you can find the papers and so on online. Um, but taking them to task, and, and I'm happy to say that I'm frequently finding at big museums and small museums that the staff working, really working day in, day out the museum, they are eager to change those rules. It's, it's just that institutional inertia, it's the drag you know, that's keeping organizations from really stepping out and changing, and some have, but not very many. So it's one of my, one of my pet issues, I'm glad you raised it. So we have a, um, a, a question slash observation from the Twitters um, that there has been uh, some dismay that there's been little discussion of open educational resources or open textbooks mm -hmm. in this discussion. Um, any quick responses to that before we go to our break? Well, you, you touched on linking to, yeah. to repositories. So you can amplify on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Everything that we have said in praise of open access resources applies to open educational resources uh, and to, to open textbooks. And you know, we've had a number of experiments at Duke before MOOCs to create open classrooms and open classes, uh, all in favor of it. I'm mm -hmm. really glad the, the Twitterverse uh, brought it up so mm -hmm. we can we can say okay. yes yay yeah and at the bare minimum I know a lot of people are advocating that if you make something really open access it also has to have a generous Creative Commons license that's another subject at the bare minimum open access means it's there for you to see to read to watch without a, any kind of firewall or permission etc and, and in, as a resource to support our teaching, whether it's MOOCs teaching or anything else, these are hugely valuable resources. Do it. Be, if you, that's what you want with the material you're creating, put it out there. And once it's out there, if it's what serves your needs in teaching, link to it. And a related resource uh, is the uh, Code of Best Practices for Open Courseware. 
uh, because OpenCourseWare is very similar to the MOOC uh, phenomenon. You know, it's a, it's a teaching experience that's meant to be openly available on the web. And uh, there was a whole process of developing best practices and fair use around that phenomenon. So if you're looking for guidance, uh, those best practices might also be an important resource. With that, I think we're just past our three o'clock line. So thank you all very much. Uh, it's been a wonderful thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.